Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do so is to like us on Facebook. We post all sorts of information there. And don't forget that there's an audio version of this message on Apple Podcasts. Just search the Foundry Church. With that said, let's dive into our Advent series called Expecting. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Isn't Mary engaged to Joseph? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Since I am a virgin. Did you hear about Mary's condition? Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary, Mary, I believe you. The angel told me not to be afraid to take you home as my wife. What is conceived in you is from the Holy Spirit. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. For us the child is born, for us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matt Kuman. I'm excited to be with you guys today. As you saw, we are in a series on expecting. I mean, especially this time of year, there this time of year, there's so many things that we expect, right? There's so many different things that we expect in this season, especially how, how many of you have an expectation when the Christmas tree goes up, right? Uh, yeah, a few of you. Um, I was raised on after Thanksgiving, the Christmas tree could, could go up. Any of you like that too? It may go up after that. And then I, I ended up marrying um, someone who I didn't realize how much of a Christmas fanatic uh, she was. She just loves Christmas. And every year it seems to get earlier and earlier. I, I try to fight it, but this year it ended up going up November 1. What? Yeah, that's not even legal, I don't think. But we all, we all have expectations around some different things. Um, and especially as what we're going to be diving into today, uh, the issue about mighty God. What some of the expectations around mighty God are, especially in a time frame of uh, the people before Jesus was born. So what were their expectations about mighty God? So to do that, we're going to look at some of the key verses in Isaiah 9. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Otherwise, the words are going to be on the screen. So Isaiah 9 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Right, there's some big expectations in just those few verses right there, isn't there? There's some big expectations about what some of those words might mean. You think about wonderful counselor. Is wonderful counselor a word that means or a person that means someone you can go to with any problem that you might have and they're just a really good listener, right? Is that wonderful counselor? 
Or is it someone where you go to and you talk about your problems and they have the best advice? They're wise. They have wisdom that can tell you and steer you in a direction that would be best. Right? Those are kind of two different things. What, what does it mean? What are the expectations around that? In the same way, there's mighty God. Right? Is mighty God someone who you can go to with any problem and they'll help you fix it because they're just that big and they're that mighty? Or is it a warrior, right? A protector, someone who will protect you from things and go to battle for you because they're so mighty. See, there's different expectations for the same word and we can often hear things differently. I think of especially this time of year with parties, right? If you say that the party is at six o'clock, um, we'd love for you to come to the party. There's three different types of people. Aren't there? There's the group of people that show up at 5.30 and walk in the door and say, hey, what can we help with? And you think, well, we're still cleaning, so maybe go back to your car for a half hour because we told you 6 o'clock. Right? There's those type of people. There's also the type of people who will kind of map quest it. No, that's not, a, that's not a real thing anymore. They Google Maps it, right? That's better. They Google Maps it and figure out exactly how far away they are from your house, and they'll leave at the exact time, and they will speed up or slow down depending on how the traffic's doing, and they will pull in the driveway right at 6 o'clock, right on time. And then there's also the type of people that, oh, the party's at 6? Well, I'll leave my house at 6 or maybe 6.15 because I want to show up fashionably late. I do not want to be the first people there. I'm going to show up when the party is rolling and that is when I get there. Right? There's different expectations about the same thing sometimes. And in a similar way, the people in the Old Testament would read the scriptures or prophecies in different ways. They'd be the same scripture, but yet there's different ideas that come around it, especially over prophecies. And you see, if you're not familiar with the word prophecies, it's kind of a, kind of a foretelling or, or a prediction or forecast for what's to come. And in, in the case of the Bible, it's the prediction or forecast of who the Savior or Messiah is going to be. And what's fascinating about before when Jesus was born and people were reading the scriptures, the, they would be really well versed in the scriptures. Because their schooling process wouldn't be so much about studying science or math. They would be studying the scriptures rigorously. Right? By the time many of them would get through school and they would have read the whole Bible and have been studying the whole Old Testament. And if they were good at it, they would all even get to the point that they would have the whole Old Testament memorized. So you can imagine that in this time frame before Jesus was born, these people knew the scriptures, right? And they knew the prophecies. They knew what to look for when it was talking about the Savior and Messiah. They knew a lot of those things. So I'm going to read a few verses from different books in the Old Testament. And I want you to be thinking about if you were in their shoes, if you were if you were around before Jesus was born, what kind of a savior would you be thinking about? Who, what, what pops into your mind? So we're going to start with Exodus 15. Now, at that time, this was right after Moses kind of delivered everyone from the, uh, the Egyptians. Okay, so they're, they've just been kind of saved from slavery. And it says this, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. What do you think about? When you hear those words, what comes to mind for who that Savior is going to be, who he's going to look like? What about this one from Jeremiah 20? But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. What do you picture? Who do you see in your mind when you think about these things? Isaiah 42, the Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. What are you thinking? 
Even the verses we just read to start off from Isaiah 9, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. See, knowing all these things, when you put yourself in that story, what kind of person are you picturing? When you hear about the prophecies of the coming Messiah and the coming Savior, who do you think is going to be filling those shoes? What, what, when you're thinking about who's coming, who comes to mind? See, you picture a warrior, right? Someone who's going to fight for them in battle. And what does Jesus come as? Comes in a, as a baby in a manger in a place that really wasn't very powerful. We read um, in Luke about his birth. It says, So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to a firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So how did Jesus come and how did Jesus enter this world? As a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. And if we know anything about Bethlehem, we understand that Bethlehem isn't a city that's really well fortified. Right? There's not warriors being birthed out of Bethlehem. There's not a big fort there with, with people ready to fight. Right? He's born and he doesn't even really have a place to be born. They're trying so hard to find room. And he's born in a city that is far from powerful. But not only that, but Jesus was also born into a world that was living in fear. You see, at that time, Rome was in power. The Romans were fearless. And anyone who stepped in the way of Rome got punished severely. Right? So people at that time, before Jesus was born, they were living in fear. Because if they stepped out of line, Rome was not afraid to put people on a cross. There were mass murders and people hung on crosses daily. It was an image that everyone would be aware of. These people were living in fear. You see, at that time, they were praying for a warrior. They were praying for a savior who would come and save them from the Romans, who would lead them into battle and stop the persecution that was happening. They had expectations of who this savior was going to be. But when Jesus was born, you could say they had unmet expectations. Because it didn't just stop when he was born. Right? It didn't change as he was growing up. He didn't get older and start uh, going to battle, and he didn't start training with swords and knives and ready to fight, did he? No. We, we find that Jesus, at the age of 12, went to the temple and he started teaching. Right? He's not learning how to use swords well. He's not fighting. He's not going into combat to figure out how to win. He's teaching in the temple. And it doesn't just stop there. What they figure out that when Jesus starts his ministry, when he's about 30 years old, Jesus is spending time with the very people that the Jews hated the most. See, the tax collectors back in that day and age were Jews who kind of flip-flop sides. They'd collect the money for Rome from their friends and families in the area, and they would get wealthy. You see, they were almost traitors in a way. And Jesus is eating with them and sharing meals and he's spending time with those kind of people. He's not trying to fight them. He is sharing food with them. Right? That is not what they expected. But the reason so many people didn't, expe- didn't accept Jesus for who he was for the coming Messiah was because he, they were expecting him to come with judgment on the enemies of God, the tax collectors, the Romans, they were expecting him to rain down on them. And instead, he came to offer forgiveness. And that didn't ring really well with many of those people. It wasn't that they hadn't read the scriptures. 
right? These people knew the scriptures and knew what, what to look for. It's just that Jesus didn't fit their reading, right? They put the coming Messiah in a small box and they said, this is what we expect and this is what we, we need him to do. And Jesus didn't fit that bill. See, what, what expectations do we have? Right, when we relate it to our lives, what expectations do we have? When you look back five years on your life and think back to today and now, are there some differences? Right? Did you expect some things five years ago that you really thought you'd be in a different spot now? See, maybe if you're a student or in high school or college, you thought you'd make a sports team. Right? And you thought maybe you could play in college and maybe someday you could pay, play professionally. And then you don't make the sports team. Trust me, I can relate to that one. Coaches weren't typically looking for lanky and uncoordinated people on their teams. See, maybe you expected to be in a different job or you expected to have a promotion and be moving up the corporate ladder and yet it didn't go as you expected. You're still in a different spot. Or maybe your family looks different than you imagined. Maybe by now you thought you'd have little kids running around your house. Maybe there's an empty table at the dinner table that wasn't empty a few years ago. Maybe our families are different than we expected. Or maybe you just thought you'd have more hair on your head after five years. right? We have different expectations about different things going on in our lives. And how do we feel when we're let down on expectations, right? If you're anything like me, you're frustrated, right? Frustrated, maybe angry, you get upset, disappointed that things didn't work out like you anticipated. See, we want a specific thing when we ask God sometimes, right? We want a very specific thing and we want him to answer in a specific way. And when it doesn't go out as we planned, we get frustrated. Those, those emotions are real. See, and this, this got really personal for me about a year ago, actually. I was in a job that I loved the people in. I was a youth pastor, and I, I was one of those youth pastors that on, when there was going to be a bunch of snow, I'd text all the students and be like, if there's a snow day, we are all hanging out. You're all coming to church at 9 o'clock if there's a snow day. So we'd have this all figured out. Because if there's a snow day, they, it's not safe enough to go to school, but it is safe enough to come to church, right? That's all all right. So we, I just had a blast with the students. I had a ton of fun building relationships with parents. And I was starting to get to the point where I felt like God was pushing me to have a different calling or a different purpose. And I kind of shared those things with my wife. And we were wrestling with what that would look like. And she actually started praying about those things and writing them in a prayer journal. And I didn't, I didn't actually know that was happening. Um, and about a week and a half ago, we went out on a date and went to Kilwins for ice cream. Because why won't you get ice cream when it's 20 degrees outside? And went to Kilwins and we were sitting there talking. And she's like, I was looking through my prayer journals. And I, one really stuck out from a year ago. See, on... December 7, so a year ago from this weekend, uh, my wife wrote this in her prayer journal. She said this, I pray that you give Matt what he needs to push him and guide him in the direction you have planned for him and for us. I pray that you have in store for Matt that he uses those gifts and helps him find such a purpose for his job that it's nothing we could even dream of for ourselves. See, she continued to write prayers like that. We were asking God to show up, and in February, he showed up, and we completely missed him. We didn't even know he was there. You see, in February, all of a sudden, I had a job, and I was in a job that had an end date, and I wasn't ready for it, and there was no viable options out there for me to continue working at the church. You see, I had to look around at all the students and all the parents that we had built relationships with over the last five or six years and think, well, I'm, I'm not actually going to be in their life nearly as much as I used to be. See, all of a sudden, all those things were starting to change. 
and I wrestled with God and said, why, why are you doing this, right? I didn't ask for this. Why aren't you present in our lives right now? What, it, what are you doing? And for months, for months, we wrestled with where God was. We we're trying so hard to see how God was working in our lives, and we just couldn't. We couldn't figure out what he was trying to do. We were so frustrated and even questioning God to the extent of like, do you even want me in ministry anymore? Like I feel, I, I thought you wanted me to be in ministry and why are you taking this away from me? See, but then we realized that, and we just currently realized that we did ask for that in a way. Right, Jalen asked for purpose in my work and a calling for what we believed in. And God, he, he more than answered. You see, but it wasn't on our terms or in the way that we had kind of outlined for it to happen. See, it wasn't until a few weeks ago that Jalen looked back at that prayer journal and thought, oh my word, like we actually asked for this. You see, my wife prayed for me to find purpose in my work and a love for God and a love for the things that are going on in the church. And he answered it. Not just just in a way that we didn't expect. And see, that's, that's exactly what he did with Jesus, didn't he? When he sent his son Jesus, he came in a very unexpected way. You see, the people back in that day and age were looking for someone to come and save the world. They needed a savior from Rome, and Jesus came, right? He came as a savior, but he came as a savior over their eternal lives. You see, they wanted a king, someone who would reign over them and protect them from people. And Jesus came as a king. But he came as the king of kings, even more than they could imagine. You see, they wanted a protector, someone who would fight for them. And Jesus, he came as a protector over their spirits, right, over their souls. And I don't, I don't know where you're expecting God to show up in your life. And I don't know where you are on that journey of moments, whether you're at the beginning of it and you don't know where God is, or you're in the middle of it and you're still like, I, I'm, I'm even more confused than in the beginning, right? Or if you're in the end, like, okay, I, I can see where God was working through those moments, whether I saw it or not. See, what I do know is that we need to focus, we, we can't focus on the letdown. We need to be focusing on what he is doing. You see, about a month after I was told that I wasn't going to have a job much longer at South Harbor, I had a conversation with two of the parents, uh, a couple, and they were very involved with student ministries where I was working. Uh, They would go on a lot of trips with us. We really respected them. Um, So we went out. They didn't know what was going on. We went out to um, dinner with them at Pete's Bar and Grill in Byron Center, because why wouldn't you go to Pete's Bar and Grill? And uh, we started explaining what was going on in our lives. And I kind of poured out my heart for where where I was at and why I didn't think God was present in our lives. And I literally started weeping in a bar, which is weird. I won't encourage that. It's, uh, people look at you in a different way. See, but what, what stuck out to me is during that conversation, they stopped and said, I know how painful this is now. Like, th- they just couldn't imagine the pain we were going through. But they're like, you need to understand, we, we cannot wait to see what God does in your life because he is working in some crazy ways right now. You guys are going to be in a very different spot in a little bit. We just don't know what it is now. We are so excited to see what God does in your life. Oh, oh man. How crazy is that? Right? What, what would it look like if, if we poured into people and thought, Oh, God is in your life. You just can't see it now. If there's big things going on in your life, there is a reason for it. Sometimes we just have God painted in this tiny box in the way we want him to answer our prayers. And yet, when he answers them in a way that's just off to the side of it, we don't even think he's present because it's not what we expected. The question I want you to ask yourselves, do you reject God when he doesn't show up as you expected. See, the people back in the Old Testament, 
there's a very, very good image of after Jesus has done his ministry, he is on a stage in front of a ton of people with Pilate on one side of them and Barabbas on the other. And Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong, but what he asks the crowd, he says, do you want me to release Barabbas or Jesus? What do you want me to do with Jesus? Well, what do you, he, I haven't found anything wrong from him. What do you want me to do? Crucify him. Crucify him. The crowd continued shouting. And that's what happened. You see, they rejected him. Because Jesus came as everything they asked for. He came as the Savior. He came as their King. He came as their Protector. But he didn't fit into the box that they had created for what their Savior, King, and Protector looked like. And they rejected him. See, what's fascinating about the person standing next to Jesus, Barabbas, is that he was very different than Jesus. But he was what the crowd expected. You see, Barabbas was known as a zealot. And he had been in and out of jail, most likely, for most of his life. Zealots would rise up against the higher power, so in that case, Rome, and would try to murder as many soldiers as they possibly could. So Barabbas was, was someone that the crowd anticipated, right? They expected someone more like Barabbas, someone who would be ready to stand up and fight for them. So their savior is standing on a stage next to a killer and a murderer, and because he fit their mold of what their savior was supposed to look like, they crucified Jesus. They rejected him. See, do you reject God when he doesn't show up as you expected? Do you get angry or get frustrated or lose hope in God because you've put him in a little bubble and you only want him to answer your prayers in this very specific way? And if he doesn't, well, he, you could completely miss him, right? Do you, do you start to get angry and confused and start relying on your own worldly ideas, right? Do you forget to Okay, God, if you're not going to answer my prayers, I'm going to figure out a way to do it myself. Or do you start relying on worldly things? Or do you get upset and turn to an addiction because that's a safe place to be? Or do you turn to friends who will tell you to do things that you know are not godly, but since God isn't answering your prayer in the way you thought, well, at least something's getting done. Right? It's, it, it's an answer to something. At least I'm moving in a direction. Right? How often do when we reject God, we completely turn away? You see, he is there. And he is present. But maybe we don't see him because he just doesn't look like we expected him to. Maybe he doesn't look like how we pictured God to show up in our lives. Because sometimes it's confusing. Right? You have things that come up in your life that are unanswerable. And you think, where is God in this, right? It's in those moments that maybe we have to start thinking about instead of giving in a specific idea of where he is, well, maybe he's answering in a different way than we didn't expect. See, when things get hard, when unexpected things happen, instead of turning away from God, what would happen if we started leaning on God? And how do we do that? It's by getting into the word. It truly is by getting into devotions and not letting the temptations of the world decide what we expect. Right? If we get into devos and get into groups and have conversations with the people around us about, I don't know where God is in this moment. I have no idea why this would be happening in my life. Right? Me and Jalen were at a loss when, when things went down with us. And it wasn't until we had people speak into our lives that, oh, God is working in you. You just don't know it yet. It's going to be so exciting. See, and it was for us because God opened a door for us. And that door was here at the foundry. And that door led me to be able to preach. And then 
help Eric and Erica with content and devotions. And then I got the chance to help with profession of faith class and see some young adults ask questions about who Jesus was and who God was. And I got to laugh with a staff like I've never laughed before. You see, God is working. He is there. Sometimes he's just not in that perfect little box that we expected him to be in. See, how can you lean on him? It's by having conversations with your groups about where God is in your life. Because sometimes we are so blinded by what's happening that we can't see how God is working. See, we have a mighty God. Listen to this last thing. We have a mighty God, and he is there even in the most unmet expectations that we have going on around us. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the way you spoke through Isaiah and the different meanings we can hear behind mighty God. And I ask that we don't fall into the same temptations that the people did in the Old Testament to think what it looks like to have a mighty God. And I ask that you take the things you've taught us about who you are and what you do in our lives and you help us to avoid worldly things around us. I ask that we always lean on you in what we say and we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description, and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of what we call our weekly rhythm here at The Foundry, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week.